All right, thank you, Greg, and everybody. I'd like to welcome um, all of you here uh, and thank the conference committee for planning this wonderful program. I know how much effort goes into this, so once again, I would like to thank them. Um, my name is Luke Gervasi. I'm a certified lake manager and ecologist with GEI Consultants in Huntington and a former LISMA staff member, and I have helped plan one of these. That's why I thank them again, because I know how much goes into it. Um, I will be moderating our first session, Local Ecology Updates. We are pleased to have local experts Robert Cole, Daniel Gilrain, and my current co-worker Laura Schwanoff, all of whom I believe are Stumpies or ESF graduates like myself. Um, so we are a contingent that goes everywhere, it seems. Um, they're going to share some updates on various Long Island ecosystems from forest to coast. Starting off, we're going to have Robert Cole. He's going to be discussing threats to Long Island forests and delve into management strategies <clears throat> and techniques for promoting forest resilience. Rob is a forester and certified arborist with DEC Forest Health. He began his career with DEC in 2006 after earning an associate's and bachelor's in forestry from SUNY ESF. Rob has led a variety of forest pest management projects across the state with his current focus being on the long-term silvicultural practices that will improve forest resiliency to pest disease outbreaks. Rob's work on Long Island includes leading DEC's Southern Pine Beetle response from 2015 to 2018, partnering with the Pine Barrens Commission to build a prescribed fire management program for the Pine Barrens, and now leading Pine Barrens restoration projects on DEC lands on Long Island. Without further ado, please welcome Rob Culp. Awesome. All right. So let's get started here. So uh, if you're familiar with the Long Island Pine Barrens, you, you think of uh, a lot of pitch pine trees, really dense forests, and you think, okay, yeah, it's the woods. It's this dark, crazy area that we don't venture in too much because, you know, it's, there's not paved roads and street signs and everything out here. So, uh, but pitch pine barrens, when we're really talking about pitch pine barrens, we need to have some barrens in there. And historically, the pitch pine barrens would have been uh, more barren. So uh, what's happened over the years is through different land management uh, strategies, including fire suppression, we've ended up uh, with what you see on the far right hand side of the picture. Uh, let's see if the pointer works. Oh, I can point. Awesome. So, uh, over here, look, at, there's no very little light penetrating here. The understory is thick with this scrub oak. Uh, and what we really want to have in a pitch pine barrens is what you see on the left hand side of the picture, this far more uh, thin area. So, uh, not loud enough. All right. All right. I'll get louder for you. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's see. Turn that. You're welcome. Uh, all right. So zooming in on that picture a little bit. Uh, again, here's this dark, dense area. This is not conducive to anything that loves pitch pine barrens. So, uh, you know, I mentioned this is very thick with scrub oak, and you go, okay, scrub oak. Well, uh, the coastal buck moth loves scrub oak, Rob. So why is the scrub oak bad? Well, the coastal buck moth, which is an endangered species that does uh, live in the pitch pine barrens. It does love scrub oak, but it loves young, tender, new growth uh, out in the sun, nice sprouts and everything. So do you think all this slow growing, very woody scrub oak underneath the canopy is great for coastal buck moth? No, it's not. They would much rather have small uh, areas of scrub oak out here in the sun where it grows. It either gets uh, you know mowed down or ideally it would be burned every once in a while. Is he not speaking into the microphone? I can't speak any more into the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I'll do better. Um, so <clears throat> over here, we have what a lot of us think as think of as pitch pine barrens. Uh, but on the left is really what we want. So the other things you see here, and it's hard to tell um, because I zoomed in a lot. Uh, this is little blue stem grass, another native species here. Uh, a lot of things grow in these open areas, uh, specific plants uh, that then support different uh, invertebrates. Uh, um, a lot of things, there are a lot of endangered species that call the Pine Barrens home. Uh, and we go, okay, we gotta protect the Pine Barrens and we're used to trying to protect this when in fact, that is not what most of these endangered species want. They want uh, these far more open areas. 
So uh, this is just, uh, if we go back to, I don't want to click too much. All right, so you got the dense area over here, this area that we've already thinned. So we went in uh, this winter and we thinned it out. So you notice now you see um, the treetops on the ground. You can look into that stand a lot further. It's going to be a lot more opened up. Uh, and then we will go in there and we'll uh, deal with that slash either uh, through piling it and burning it, removing it, or just burning it as is. But this side over here now at this point has had some fire through it. Again, you can see through the stand, you can see the sky, and now you can see the sky over here. So that's one of our big things that we're looking at is, uh, you know, these dense stands, when you look up, you're not able to see through them and see the sky. And really with pitch pine barrens, uh, that's really what we want to be able to do is look through and see the sky. So uh, one reason that uh, these dense stands are uh, uh, really bad is because they're also the highest hazard for supporting southern pine beetle populations. So you can see this is a very dense stand. You can walk through, I can walk through and touch trees with both hands. I might have a larger wingspan than most, but it's close. You can see you're not looking through this understory. It's full of stems. Uh, when you get a dense stand like this, Southern pine beetle communicates using pheromones and a pheromone plume. So when they get in a stand like this, the pheromone plume, there's not a lot of breeze. There's not a, the sun's not hitting the ground and heating up and creating convection, convection currents. So the pheromone plume really builds up in there and it allows the Southern pine beetle to mass attack trees, overcome the trees defenses, and then you end up uh, with dead trees and then here's some discolored ones and you know green ones that haven't been impacted here yet. Uh, but this stand will support Southern pine beetle really well, as opposed to those open stands that we're creating where the wind will move through, the sun will hit the ground, create those convection currents. The pheromone plume will spread out and you think, well, that kind of sounds backwards. Why do we want the pheromone plume to spread out? Uh, but if it spreads out, it's, it's weak and all the SPB spread out and they can never mass attack a tree and overcome its defenses. Remember, it's pitch pine, so it creates a lot of pitch and it can pitch out, you know, a few insects, 20, 50 of them. Uh, so it really takes hundreds or thousands to overcome that individual tree defense. Uh, so when the pheromone plume spreads way out, enough never attack, uh, the trees uh, in mass to create an outbreak. <clears throat> All right, so here's here's uh, so when we go into those areas with southern pine beetle, um, we do what's called suppression. We're taking the trees that have live insects in them. If they've already killed the tree and moved on, we don't worry about those trees. They're just standing dead trees. They're great for wildlife all sorts of things. So we go in and we cut infested trees and we cut trees just ahead of that front as a buffer because they probably have some SPB in them and we just don't know it. So here's an area where all we did was suppression. Uh, we cut down in, uh, some of those infested trees and buffer trees. And what we are left with it, uh, without doing any burning, without doing any other site prep, is we have a beautiful pine barren scenario coming back here. So again, you see the little blue stem. Uh, there are some little, um, little scrub oaks growing over here. And again, that kind of bushy, uh, you know, with fresh growth kind of scrub oak, that's what our um, endangered species really like. Uh, so even without taking those extra steps, uh, when we get out and thin out the forest just because it has southern pine beetle, we're already bringing that kind of barrens um, landscape back. So here's an area where, you know, we're just going to start burning eventually um, to get that fire cycle back in there. Um, and it's ready to go. Uh, so one of the big things we're dealing with because of fire suppression uh, is these really thick understories. So typically, uh, you know, if we had regular fire intervals, um, you know, some big fires moving through maybe every hundred years and then smaller fires on a more, um, more frequent scale, say every 15 or 20 years, uh, it would go through and kill a lot of this undergrowth. So this is all scrub oak here. It's about this tall. I can't walk through it. Nothing's walking through it. Um, it's not good for the Pine Barrens ecosystem to have huge areas like that. Again, it's choking out all the plants. These aren't healthy, vigorous uh, scrub oak. They've just gotten big and now they're hanging out there. Uh, so with regular fire return, 
uh, you would, a fire would go through here and kill all this stuff. And it would just preserve the pitch pines and maybe some of the larger oak that have thicker bark. But the fire really would manage the oak for, well, fire would manage the oak uh, for us, except we have, you know, in the past hundred years, we've been really about putting fires out rather than letting them burn. And especially in this ecosystem, uh, they're de it is dependent on fire. So, um, we we are our intention is to get a lot of fire back in these areas here's another area that was cleared out um, and then just allowed to grow back so we have um, hundreds of acres of what we call dog hair thick pitch pine these pitch pine are um, you know three to six inches in diameter and again we have hundreds of acres of this and if we had regular fire going through uh, we would kill off some of these smaller trees we would create these patches rather than having hundreds of acres of all the same uh, density small trees we would have more of a mosaic we'd have larger trees we it's not bad to have areas like this just when we have hundreds and hundreds of acres of it this is a huge fire risk uh, the canopies are all very close together there's ladder fuels uh, we have the ladder fuels here with all the scrub oak so that's another big thing we're working on is getting rid of some of these ladder fuels because we're working uh, you know, kind of in the wildland urban interface. And uh, if we can do ecological management and also some fuels management and protect the folks that live around there, uh, that's awesome. That's a win-win. So um, a lot of the work we've had to do um, when we're talking with this restoration work is we all love to get in and deal with the trees, right? We want to fix the plants. We want to... Um, but when we got to, so a lot of this work has taken place in Sarnoff State Forest, if you're aware of where that is, um, we couldn't even get in there. These properties had been um, not managed uh, in years um, for this type of work. Um, uh, it just it just wasn't necessary. Folks thought, okay, the Pine Barrens are doing the Pine Barrens thing. So when we go to show up and we need to do these clearings and we want to do fire on the ground, the first thing we had to do was take foot trails and turn them into truck trails. So um, DEC has invested uh, thousands and thousands of dollars in opening up these properties so that we can get in there and set it up for fire management. Uh, you know, the access is really key. Um, if we're going to do any restoration, any work here, we have to actually be able to get into it. So um, this is, I just wanted to kind of point that out as an infrastructure thing when we're doing these projects. It doesn't, it doesn't just automatically happen. Um, there is a lot of background work that we've put into it. Uh, and one of the big things that we've done here is we've set up uh, the Central Pine Barrens Commission uh, to start managing uh, a, a fire program. So... Uh, I work with Polly, who you see over there on the right, um, and that's their the commission's new engine. So DEC uh, is contracted with the commission, and we provide them funds so that they can start a, a holistic approach to managing uh, fire in the Pine Barrens. Uh, up until this point, uh, DEC didn't have a huge burn program. Uh, BNL does, you know, a significant amount of burning. Uh, there's, but there's various priorities. There's grassland burns. There's fire burns. So we really wanted to get a local entity kind of pulling all those folks together, making uh, regional priorities based on all different land ownerships, not just DEC saying, well, we're the most important. So. Um, only burn on our land. No, we realize that there's other partners, especially, you know, you know like Brookhaven, um, who have a lot of good, good areas that should be burned. So um, we're funding this. And as you can see, it really is a, um, excuse me, it's a multi uh, agency collaboration. So you see on the picture on the bottom, there's a bunch of DEC staff. Um, we have our commission staff. Uh, and our forest rangers with deep forests and the forest rangers, Brian Gallagher has been leading a lot of the burns for us. Um, and that's going really well. But if we're going to do this, we have to have that collaboration, right? It's not just me as a forester and lands and forests. Uh, we need the fire specialists. We need the local land managers who know uh, what's going on. So we have a really great collaborative effort with people on Long Island, people coming from off Long Island, different divisions in DEC, et cetera. So one thing that Brian has been helping us with uh, this past winter is doing pile burning. So you notice when we thin out those really thick stands, it leaves a lot of slash on the ground. 
uh, you could go through and try to burn that with a regular, regular prescribed burn, uh, but there's going to be a lot of flashy fuels. It's going to be hard to get in there. It's not super accessible. Uh, so they chose to put some piles together, which you can see in the upper left uh, like this. Uh, that way they could pull it all together, make access through the rest of the stand really easy. Uh, it arranges the fuels in a way that they know where they are. They know how they're going to react rather than just having stuff all over. You know, you get jackpots and stuff you weren't ready for and you get huge flames. Uh, so it's really helpful for them to pull a lot of that slash together and burn it in piles. Uh, and, you know, to get it going, just we, we use uh, things like leaf blowers. We light these up and then we just blow it and we can uh, really take these piles down. And so then you're left with this after the fact, a really nice uh, setup for a pine barrens here. So now we'll come through with some broadcast burning uh, throughout the whole stand uh, this this spring, hopefully. Uh, and, and then this is gonna be uh, on its way to being a restored uh, pitch pine barrens. So just to talk a little bit about it. So here's some more pictures. These were closed canopy forests uh, as of November. We did uh, over 300 acres of thinning uh, through this stand 12. 16, 17, 18, uh, this area in here. Uh, and this is Sarnoff State Forest, for those of you who aren't aware. Riverhead is just to the north off the screen. To the south, this is Dwarf, uh, dwarf Pine Barrens. Uh, so we did about 300 acres here. And uh, in this northern area up here, these stands one, two, three, four, five point one, and 6. That's about another 100 acres, um, and we've gone in there uh, with, a, with a mower, a forestry mower and a brush hog, and we've mowed everything down, uh, all those oak sprouts that you saw, all the tall grasses, all the slash got it down on the ground, and those areas are going to be ready to burn this spring. So we hope to have uh, at least 100 or so acres burned at Sarnoff State Forest this spring. And once it's burned, you'll have these open stands, um, you'll start getting those grasses in. Uh, there's a lot of blueberry and huckleberry at Sarnoff, so we'll have some bumper crops. You know, the berries really love fire. Um, it prepares the soil and the acidity really well. So, um, you know, our restoration work here, we're focused on the trees and, manage, and, and creating a pitch pine barrens. Um, but the offshoot of, of what we're doing just with the trees and then the burning, uh, is going to have a huge effect, like I said, on a lot of different endangered species that call this forest home. Um, it's going to be really positive for a lot of things. So uh, we're really excited about this work. Uh, and we do, we're going to carry it on. It's going to keep going. We're going to be moving up to Rocky Point probably next year to carry this work on. Um, but so that's kind of what's going on uh, with pitch pine and, uh, you know, the overly dense pitch pine barrens. So I'm going to move on to oak will uh okay now so hopefully folks are familiar with oak wilt here i think i've talked on long island several times about oak wilt but if you're not that's okay um <clears throat> so we're going to look at the picture on the right here um pretend this orange tree is here for the benefit of the conversation until I tell you that it's not there anymore. And then you can pretend it's not there anymore. Uh, so this homeowner uh, uh, had this tree here and had some branches trimmed off of it that hung over the house. And she had this work done in March. Uh, and so uh, oak wilt moves a couple different ways. And one of the ways is by insects that are attracted to wounds on oak trees. And these are netted dulid beetles. And they're out in the spring, March, April, May, June, especially. Uh, so she had this work done uh, in the springtime. Uh, and then she noticed uh, in August, the tree was dropping leaves. They were discolored, uh, didn't look great. But she said, all right, well, you know, it could just be a fluke. I'll leave it there. Uh, and we'll see what happens next spring. Next spring, the tree did not leaf out, so she had it removed. Uh, but there's two ways uh, that oak will uh, moves, and I told you the first way was insects attracted to wounds. The second way is through root grafts with other red oak trees. So by her leaving the tree here over the winter, the fungus had time to move back down the stem through the roots into this tree that you see standing right here. So she had this tree cut down in the springtime, said, okay, it didn't leaf out, it's done, it's dead, great. Uh, but then come the following July, 
her tree looked like this. So uh, I took this picture uh, sometime in August, uh, but you can tell for an oak tree, that's not right. Oaks hold on to their leaves for a really long time. She even knew that, the homeowner, she said, well, usually I'm raking them out of the gutters in the landscape the following spring. Why are all the leaves coming off the tree now? This can't be right. So she called her local uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension who got Ag and Markets involved, who got us involved. Uh, but so that's a good real life example of this uh, this um, this graph thing over here. So you have healthy trees, the insects feed on the spore mats that are produced by the, the trees when they die. They get these spores on them. Like I said, they're attracted to wounded trees. So with the spores, they fly to healthy trees that have wounds on them. Those wounds could be from a windstorm, an ice storm, snowstorm, anything that occurred late in the season while the insects are out. Um, but it could also be us pruning. So, uh, uh, so keep that in mind wounds. We make wounds when we're out there pruning and a lot of folks prune in the spring. So it's not the best time to be pruning your oaks in the spring, unless you're, uh, you know, want to roll the dice for getting oak wilt in your oak trees. So, uh, so they're in the wounds. You see that the leaves discolor, the leaves usually drop from the top down, uh, and then the tree dies. It takes uh, about six weeks for trees in the red oak group to die. So that's northern red oak, pin oak, scarlet oak, black oak, um, all of which you have here on the island. So it takes about six weeks for those to die over the summer. Uh, and then as it stands there, like I said, if it stands over the winter, you can get uh, movement through the root grafts to the healthy trees, and then you have additional trees die the next year. So uh, we have oak will. Oak will is mainly an issue uh, out in the Finger Lakes upstate now. Um, the impact here uh, to Long Island, uh, Brooklyn, and then a uh, few sites out in Suffolk County. We found these in 2017, 2016, 17, and 18. Um, we haven't found any additional detection since those original trees. Uh, and so since it's been more than five years, uh, we no longer regulate this area. So you may or may not know, but we actually had quarantine zones around these locations and all of Suffolk County was quarantined for moving oak out. It is no longer quarantined. So if you didn't know that, then just keep doing what you're doing. And if you did know that, well, now you don't have to worry about it because we don't have the quarantine anymore. Um, so these detections, again, are more than five years old. The management in these locations in Brooklyn and Long Island are we just removed the infected tree. We didn't remove any of those possibly root grafted trees um, because we expected it to blow up down here. So I didn't, the first year of management, I didn't want to go cutting a ton of trees, not knowing where all the oak wilt may be. Um, so we actually just cut down the infected trees and the plan was we would monitor very intensively the following year, we'd pick up the rest of the oak wilt and then we'd do a full blown operation then. Well, we cut down the, the, infected, the infected trees at each of these locations and then we intensively monitored for five years and never found any additional trees. So we didn't have to go do any more follow up work there. Um, this is kind of what we see though out in the Finger Lakes. Uh, this is an oak will infected tree here. You can see it from the ground. Uh, this was hit during uh, some construction. Uh, so there's your wound. They were building the house and uh, became infected. So this goes back to that house. I was saying the homeowner, she noticed she had leaves on the ground. So this is a picture from her yard right here. This is August. You're going, well, why are we dropping leaves in August? They're all varying degrees of discoloration. So if you follow Oakwell online and you look at all the, the images, they're going to say it discolors from the outside in, from the end of the leaf down. And sure, great. Yeah, we're seeing that on some of these leaves here. But then you look at a leaf like that, and that does not meet the description uh, that they give you online of oak wills at all. So I just say, if you have discolored leaves, or if you have leaves falling from oak trees in the middle of the summer, give us a call. Don't try to go, eh, I don't think the discoloration is quite right, because we see discoloration of all shapes and sizes and forms. So um, again, our the thing that we're looking for, the diagnostic thing, is tree uh, leaves being dropped in July, August, way before they normally would. And uh, the tree is going to lose probably 80% of its leaves or more. And you can see that in this picture here on the left. Uh, so yeah, if you're looking up through the sky, you know, it's uh, again, uh, with this kind of leaf drop, 
get a hold of us, you might have oak oil. Uh, okay, yeah, so here's the tree I said uh, with construction, this guy's building his house. He went around and dinged up four trees with his equipment. And sure enough, uh, he ended up with four trees infected right around his new house that we came and cut down. Uh, additionally, uh, this is a little bit different here, but this gentleman, uh, you can see the roadway back in here. He had a nice field kind of off to the, to the right side of the screen there. And so he wanted to open it up to the road so he could see from his house and driveway, he could see all the way out to the road. So he hired somebody to come in with a forestry mower and mow all the underbrush. And the guy, he did this in May when all the nitidulids are out. And the person he hired was not super careful and they hit uh, a bunch of root flares. And with the, with the cab of their equipment, they hit branches. Every tree that that guy hit, four, became infected with oak wilt that year. And we came and cut them down. So the guy wanted to open up some clearance to the road and we helped him open up even more clearance to the road. So, um, so yeah, I'm just, you know, I really harping on this, like the wounding, that's the way the fungus gets in the trees initially. So we know that there's beetles out there with the fungus on them waiting to get to these wounds. So if there's any way you can avoid this, uh, either with your regular maintenance schedules uh, or if you're contracting out tree work, if you can avoid uh, tree work or pruning during these spring months when the nitidulids are really out, uh, that would be best because we have a lot of examples uh, of the direct impact. So with these nitidulid beetles, uh, we've been doing some research. Uh, we've been trapping for them to find out where they are. Uh, and it turns out uh, I have, uh, we have some more updated uh, information coming in uh, to suggest. So you can see here, this, this is a couple years old now, this paper. Uh, but out in the Finger Lakes, this was our known location. Uh, and when we trapped over multiple years, we found it in several other counties on beetles, not infected trees, not dead trees, just on beetles. And you can see even uh, in Brooklyn and out here at Wildwood State Forest, uh, those blue dots are from 2019. So we hadn't found an infected tree in those locations in at least two years. We go back and start trapping for the fungus and we can find it there. And we have yet to find any infected trees. So um, based on some new data that we have that uh, I'm not uh, able to report on quite yet, we're thinking the oak wilt fungus is probably throughout the oak range in New York. Um, and really why we don't see oak wilt outbreaks across New York and all over the island is um, probably, it just, it needs the perfect storm of things. So we have to have the nitidulids out, so it's gotta be in the spring. We have to have a wound that happens when the nitidulids are there and they have to have the fungus on them. For the fungus to live in the tree, it's a really poor competitor. Uh, it needs a highly specific moisture range and a highly specific temperature range. So our thought is while we may have it out on the landscape uh, on these beetles and for it to get on the beetles, there has to be infected trees somewhere. So we don't, we don't know where they are, but it's such a tiny amount that it's not killing vast amounts of oak out there. Um, we just suspect that it's out there, but we don't have those perfect conditions at every location. Uh, the wounds are attractive to the nitidulids for about 72 hours. So you give it a few days and it's not attractive anymore. So you really have to have the beetles, the beetles there, the wound there and all the proper conditions. So I just think we don't meet that criteria all around the state uh, very often or else we would see it more just based on knowing that we're trapping it out in other locations. Uh, so here is a picture of one of our most recent uh, trap catch sites. Uh, and this is a drone picture. So what we've, uh, and, and so this is located, uh, I think about 15 or 20 miles north of two known locations. Uh, but one thing we're having a problem with is even with all of these insect detections, we have not been able to associate an infected tree with it. So we know the fungus is out there, we're not finding trees. Uh, so uh, it's really difficult, uh, but we're, we've started a new drone protocol which basically we're gonna, we fly the drone up above the trapping site. Uh, we set the camera at an angle and we do a 360 and we go up higher and we do another 360. And that gives us uh, roughly a mile of really high quality imagery like this. And so we can have our drone pilots go out, do these, uh, do these circles, 
they record a, a high definition, you know, 4K video, and they send it to our technicians who then can look at it right on their computer. They don't have to travel because, uh, you know, there was a lot of sites where we found uh, beetles. So we don't have to be traveling eight hours this way, five hours that way to do all these surveys. We can send drone pilots out that are local to the area and they send all the data to us and we review it uh, on the computer, which I know doesn't sound that exciting probably to most people in the room. They're like, no, let's get out in the woods. But uh, if you have a statewide responsibility, sometimes we have to do things uh, in the office. Uh, okay, so that was Oak Will. Uh, we're gonna move on to Spongy Moth now. What am I looking at, like 10 minutes-ish? Yeah. 15? All right. Do I have to save time for questions or no? Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Hurry it up. All right. Spongy moth. So uh, over the past couple of years, spongy moth just about everywhere in New York State. Our biggest year was 730,000 acres. That was in 2022. Uh, luckily, this past statewide outbreak, I think uh, a good portion of the island has just missed it, um, which is really awesome for you guys. Uh, I don't think I need to go over ID. That's the adult there. Uh, these are the first instars when they're first coming out of the eggs. I just put this picture up here because we get a lot of calls uh, in late April and early May when they're this size and people are complaining about uh, them flying through the air and how itchy it is. If you get calls like this, it's not as ridiculous as it sounds. Uh, when they're small, they do what's called ballooning. They put out their silk and this is how they fly around and spread. And this is also when their hairs appear to be uh, most itchiest to people. People are most sensitive to the hairs when they're this size. So we get a lot of calls, people with rashes and stuff. And, and that is legit. Um, they can cause a rash and some some skin irritation. Uh, we have the European spongy moth here. Uh, it has a relative, uh, the Asian version, which is just a little bit bigger. It doesn't look that different. Um, but the one thing you can see here with the European one, when we have bad outbreaks, it will feed on a lot of different tree species. So we're used to oak, but it'll do all these other hardwoods and it'll even move into the softwoods like white pine, spruce and hemlock. The Asian variant of spongy moth has uh its host list is like 250 plants it's way worse uh than just these things that the european one gets so if you find yourself uh going wow this just this is eating a lot of crazy different things um uh asian spongy moth is intercepted at the ports fairly regularly so uh it, it is a risk that we could end up with it here the closest defoliation to this area really occurred up in the hudson valley this year um with i can't remember how i think it was you know over sixty thousand acres just in the lower hudson valley here very common to see no leaves on the trees in the beginning of june this is when uh those caterpillars are inch and a half two inches long two and a half inches long that's when they're eating a square foot of foliage a day uh when you really start to notice this uh, so that kind of gets into treatments. We get a lot of calls. People want to know in May when they start seeing the defoliation or in June, what can I do? What treatments can I do? Uh, you got to know that if it's that time of year, it's too late to treat. Uh, the insecticides that we have for spongy moth work when they're those small little caterpillars, not when they're the big two inch long caterpillars. It just, um, so to know when to treat or if you need to treat, uh, you do need to pay attention to uh, the type of egg masses. So we always uh, encourage people to go out and count egg masses over the winter to know if they need uh, a treatment in the spring, if it's going to uh, impact their trees. Uh, so you just need to know when you're counting egg masses that the new egg masses are a tan color. They're very three-dimensional and they're fuzzy. Uh, if, if you're looking at egg masses and they have a lot of holes in them, they're tattered, they're torn, they're a uh, white creamy color. That means they're old. Everything's out of them. They're not a risk. So sometimes we get calls and pictures and people say, I got millions of these egg masses and they're all old egg masses. And I go, okay, well, you don't have to worry so much this year. The worst of it has passed. Uh, again, I mentioned that treatment really ought to be occurring in this April, uh, early May window while the caterpillars are still really small. Uh, once we get into June, they're too big. Uh, and your treatments, of course, once in July and August when they're pupating and turning into adults, uh, we don't have a tre treatments for that. So, uh, and then they spend the rest of their time uh, as egg masses over the winter, which you can uh, scrape egg masses if you so desire. Uh, like I said, you can have a lot of heavy damage. Uh, and this is a picture of a, a spruce over here. So they will go after spruce. Um, 
one year of defoliation like this is not going to be great for the tree, but it will survive. Um, we've actually had hemlocks that have been like 95% defoliated that we assumed would just die, uh, that they're hanging on and actually coming back. So, um, you know, the deciduous trees, they can put out a new flush of leaves. They're fine. They can, you know, keep photosynthesis going. Uh, but the needles come from buds and depending on when the buds were formed versus the defoliation, uh, you may the tree may not be able to put out new needles, uh, which could cause uh, more of a long-term decline. All right, so just uh, to go over the damage again, this picture was taken uh, the last week of May. This picture was taken the first week of June. This is uh, in Lake George. Uh, so the, the uh, and here they hit all the hardwoods. They left a couple white pines standing here, uh, but the, the damage really can be significant. If you get defoliation like this for one year, most of the trees are gonna come back. They'll be able to recover, maybe even two years of this, but that two to three year is really the limit um, because it's the trees are sucking a lot of energy out of their roots to put these new leaves out, to keep life going. So if they get defoliated 100% like this a couple of years in a row, you're definitely gonna see some real hard decline and probably some eventual mortality. Mortality we don't usually see until two or three years later, um, but I expect in some of this area um, where we had repeated defoliations around Lake George, we will see a decent amount of mortality. And now I can't make this move. All right, so what can we do? Um, or what do we need to do? So uh, New York State doesn't treat that often. We do help state parks uh, with some really ecologically sensitive areas occasionally. Uh, but otherwise, there are some things out there on the landscape that really um, moderate the populations. And so, you know, we have like two or three year outbreaks, and then all these things naturally occur. So um, when we're thinking about spraying, we're looking at these things to see where they are. So there's a virus out there. You can see this insect in the middle. It's the upside down V. V is for virus. Um, and then the fungus here, uh, you'll see the head capsule usually is uh, hanging down and you'll see these really skinny insects. The fungus gets in there and basically eats the insides of the caterpillar. So you see them hanging down like this. And you can see these, of course, by the hundreds over here, you got some that are hanging down upside down because the fungus got them. And then you've got a bunch that are those upside down Vs because the virus got them. It usually just takes a couple of years for these, the populations of these things to build up. They kind of follow the population growth of the spongy moth. Uh, so it can be bad for a couple of years and people think it's the end of the world, but then in year three, uh, these things really come in and knock it back. And that's what we've seen around the rest of the state for the most part. Uh, and then there is an egg parasitoid. You can see the little wasp down here. It climbs in there, it pulls all this stuff apart, uh, and it, it parasitizes the eggs. It's a really cool thing. That can cause uh, up to 50% mortality of eggs in, in any egg mass that it goes and feeds in. So really important things. And what we keep in mind uh, when we're thinking about treating is not disrupting this kind of natural cycle. Of course, for homeowners, we recommend sticky bands uh, early in the season when they're moving up and down. Then we later in the season, when the caterpillars are getting big and they're looking for a place to pupate, we recommend the burlap sack because they get up in there and they put their pupil chambers in there and then you can scrape them out and get rid of them that way. And of course, you can always scrape egg masses uh, if you really just love a good time. Uh, I don't know. It's like, it's a lot of work to scrape egg masses and you need to scrape them into a bag, you know, with soapy water. So you make sure you kill the egg masses. You can't just scrape them onto the ground because they're likely to live even if you scrape them on the ground. So it's a bit of a process. Uh, so, uh, one thing, uh, we, one of the tools we have now, uh, for widespread treatment is BTK, uh, which is, uh, a bacterium, uh, pretty specific to spongy moth. It will impact other lepidopterans, uh, but if you're applying it at the right time of year, those non-target impacts are really low. Uh, back in the day, DEC had a Bureau of Forest Pest Control, and we actually owned a couple airplanes and some of these giant mist blowers. Uh, and so I just put this in here as a little side thing. This is some of the notes I found from back in the day, 6% DDT and kerosene, plus you mix your sovicide, which is banned now, and your DDT is banned. Uh, but, you know, it not it great to see you got your DDT dissolved in sovicide, a pound per quart of solvent, then diluted with kerosene. Uh, and we were out like wholesale spraying this stuff all over the place. So uh, we uh, have really reined it in, right? So we're our goal... Yeah, right. We really reined it in. Uh, <laughs> you know, so 
when we think of treatments, uh, a lot of us think, uh, you know, um, pesticides, oh, we're out there spraying everything, all this stuff is, we're going to just scorched earth, all this stuff is dying. Uh, and, and I really just want to point out, we've gone from that crazy way of doing things in 1953, to now we're using products that are very specific to the target organism. So when we're talking about treatment, especially at DEC, this is really what we're shooting for. We don't like this. We really want those specific things. So a lot of our treatments, we are really going that direction um, to reduce those non-target impacts. I got five minutes, so I just want to talk about a couple things really quickly, and that's the climate. Um, I think we all need to be paying attention to this in a really serious way because it's definitely impacting uh, the other pests that we have coming up. You might say, okay, look at this. That year it looked great, except for the beginning of the growing season. We were more than four inches below the average rain that we would receive during that time period. How do you think that impacted plant health? How do you think that impacted other diseases uh, and insects? Uh, what could take advantage of those kinds of conditions? Well, here's one for sure. Two-line chestnut borer uh, loves droughts. It'll kill uh, your oak trees pretty readily uh, in drought conditions. So this is a, a native to watch out for. You end up with a lot of stuff like this. Uh, bacterial leaf scorch. This is a late season uh, issue, um, but repeated uh, defoliation by this in end of August and early September, this will also kill trees. Um, and again, these are things that just take advantage of stress. Uh, so, sorry, I skipped over this map. The, the previous map just indicated it was a really rainy season. And then we ended up with things like bot canker, oak scale here. Um, these are things that it's just uh, water sat on this site a long time. The soil was compacted, uh, so it just made it um, uh, far more vulnerable to it. Uh, I guess I just, I won't get into beech leaf disease because I'm out of time. Three minutes. Oh, we'll do it all in three minutes then. Okay. Uh, beech leaf disease. So hopefully everybody is really familiar with this. Now, is there anybody who's not familiar with beech leaf disease? Okay, we got a couple people. So um, beech leaf disease uh is uh really the characteristic is these stripes on the leaves these are called by caused by a nematode that is that resides in the bud the leaves come out with this damage so if you see this striping on the leaves it's come out of the bud with this damage uh so this is early season when the leaves are just coming out you can see they still got some of the hair on them uh they're the really light colored and so you see those bands show up as dark uh, as you move into the, se into the season, they'll become raised up. They'll appear lighter. The rest of the leaf will get darker and leather leathery. It might start to curl over like this. And then by the end of the season in the fall, when the leaves are changing color, uh, you can still see those symptoms in the leaves. Uh, and this was at a site where I was just walking around. I said, oh, I wonder if I can see it in leaves on the ground. I pointed the camera down and there were those leaves on the ground. So you can survey for this anytime. I don't know what that says. Oh, I should just take questions, I think is what she's saying. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to pause on beech leaf disease. And if you have any questions about the other topics I discussed, now is the time. Yeah. So the question was uh, about burning on different land ownerships and what land ownerships are involved. And yeah, so I mentioned uh, DEC lands and Brookhaven National Laboratory. Yeah, the county owns, uh, Suffolk County owns uh, probably 20,000 acres of forested land. And uh, we're having a little bit of trouble getting uh, access to that property. So um, we are working through the county with that. Um, but because we have funds in availability now, our focus is uh, on the, the state and state lands and BNL, just because they're the partners we have at the moment. But we are pursuing work with the county. Yeah, go ahead. Um, about running, running. on the Oakville slide, you talked about paint immediately. If if you have a, if your tree oh, is, yeah, could you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so I skipped over that quickly. Sorry. Um, so when we're talking about wounding, uh, yeah, we do recommend painting uh, um, 
any latex paint you can buy a can of spray paint from the hardware store to spray the wound and then uh that that covers the smell that the netadulid is attracted to and even if a netadulid comes to it the paint is enough to keep the spores uh, out of that wound so yes we do so recommend just regular latex house paint you can just paint? use regular paint yep any any can of spray yeah. paint you have it's really simple it doesn't need to be lac balsam or any of those other okay. i have things. one more question how yep. many um in that area of 300 acres that you burned at, at Sarnoff, when does that ha burn up, um, have to happen again? How many years until you have oh, to burn it? Oh, yeah, again? so that 300 acres was what we've thinned so far, so that's prep to burn, so we haven't burned there yet. But yeah, our ideal uh, burn return interval would be somewhere between five and 10 years, so that we don't get the buildup of all that underbrush, yep. All right, thank you, Rob, for that presentation. We're unfortunately out of time for questions, so if you have any more, um, you could try to maybe find them throughout the rest of the conference, and I'd be remiss to say, or to not say, nice beard. Um, so as discussed, you know, we could kind of see that a lot of our threats to trees are in the form of insects, especially ones that are invasive, that are spreading unchecked without predators or natural checks like the virus. Um, that Rob was talking about with the spongy moth um, impacting those those insects. So our next speaker is going to be Daniel Gilrain, who will elaborate on the impacts of invasive uh, insects in his talk, Not Exotic Enough, Invasive Pests Here, There, and Everywhere. Um, Dan is an extension entomologist with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County and holds a master's in pest management from Cornell and a bachelor's degree from SUNY ESF. Dan has been with Cornell since 1987, providing entomology education and outreach, diagnostic services, and applied research for our agriculture and professional horticultural industries. And I know that most, if not all, of what I know about invasive insects, I have learned from Dan. So um, without further ado, please welcome Dan Gilrain. I think you should have added currently in therapy because he's dealing with so many invasive problems. So. Uh, anyway, we'll uh, move on here, if I can get this to move. Okay, invasive, whoops, back there, one more. Invasive species, so of course this is the definition of what invasive species is, non-native species that can harm the environment, economy, human health. And I would even include southern pine beetle non-native to this area. Um, I would also add the word annoying <laughs> to that description because some of the invasive species we have don't seem to have much of an environmental or economic impact, except maybe you could economize the annoyance level. So this is the definition there. Um, in the oh, 30 or so years that I've been around, this is just a short list of some of the invasive species that either I have found, uh, I have dealt with, or I've helped other people deal with or identified. Uh, this, some of these are be very familiar to, of course, Hemlock woolly adelgid, Asian longhorn beetle. I was when I started, that was one of the first things that we we were dealing with at the time. Um, Southern pine beetle was one that I found. Um, actually, Annie, Annie McIntyre with State Parks found it the first in 2014 at Kennequat State Park. There was one found in a trap uh, earlier in the year in 2014 that was not recognized until later on. And then it showed up not just at Kennequat at Wertheim and then it descended from there. But these are this is a list of some of the ones that we're encountering and it takes a lot to try to keep up with all of these. Uh, there's some that are new that are I think are coming to the area before too long and those are in blue on the lower part of that slide. Of course, hemlock woolly adelgid, it may be one of the uh, poster children for invasives that we really do not want. And this is a particular concern uh, on Long Island North Shore where we have these, but also in landscapes where hemlock is a important uh, landscape amenity plant. And especially as you get into the upstate areas where hemlocks are important along streams and just as for species. Of course, this is a, definitely one of the tree killers on that list there. Southern pine beetle that Rob mentioned, this was a real, real, real problem. As you, if anybody's driven out here from the east end, or if you've gone out towards Montauk, Napig, that area, um, Route 27 out east, you've, I'm sure you've seen uh, miles and miles and miles of devastation. And that's just what you can see from the road. Um, I deal primarily with horticulture and agriculture, but a lot of the things I work with, the insects I deal with, don't recognize uh, 
the the uh, dis the uh, landscapes only. They may work in they uh, be problems in forest areas, of course, as well. And so I get to work with those too. But I, and I always think about what landscape pest problems have implications for these forest areas. Well, this is going in the other direction. This southern pine beetle is primarily a forest problem that can also be a landscape issue on landscape plants. And when it when this sort of thing happens. Uh, one of the current concerns I have is that this results in a lot more insecticide use, and I'm trying to go away from that and help people less uh, depend much less on insecticides than we're, than we're doing. And one of the other problems is that the insecticides we use for this are pyrethroids that are bark sprays and have risks from drift and, uh, of course, affect broadly uh, non-target species when you use them. And this is the kind of things that I really would like to get away, but uh, invasive species work against that goal. Eastern white pine is also attacked, and this is part of what's really gotten me nervous is that it's bad enough that it's pitch pines, but it also will attack uh, white pines, and it seems to be capable of con killing them, and how well it reproduces in them is, I guess, maybe another question. Um, and I have seen several areas attacked with this, uh, including at one of the botanic gardens. Uh, spotted lanternfly, of course, is now here, and this is uh, primarily, I think, in the annoyance category for most people, but I work with vineyard managers out east, and uh, there's a huge amount of money riding on the vineyard economy, tourism, uh, as with production and so forth, uh, jobs, you name it, and collateral uh, industries. So this is what they'll do on grapevines. They'll gather on them in the late summer and fall, resulting in this kind of a situation where the grapevines are actually killed. Our vineyard managers are sufficiently aware of this and they have an idea what to do about it. But again, this was gonna necessitate insecticide applications at a time when they would really rather not be making insecticide applications around the time of harvest, when people wanna visit and get around in vineyards. So this is a concern. Um, late summer, this is what people are gonna see in their landscapes and I'm gonna get questions about this. I have had a lot of questions about it already, what to do about it. And this will also uh, trigger a lot of insecticide applications as well. Something I really, again, am not happy about. Uh, there are other solutions we've recommended vacuuming, which Ag and Markets has, um, has been promoting and they, that's worked quite well, but it's not the answer in every case. Sometimes just living with it. Uh, we were talking earlier in the, the uh, trade show area about uh, approaching this with more of a sense of humor. And maybe that's one answer that people can have is to deal with it more psych on a psychological level. And this is another thing that people, that people will see. I'm, I'm also reminding people that this is not damaging to landscape plants per se. They may cause stress. It's not a home invader. We have to remind people of these things to reassure them, to try to allay their fears. But the other, of course, consequence of this is if you have an annoying pest that's out on the landscape, it's not going to entice you to be outdoors in among uh, the gardens and, and the wild areas that you would like to be if you have to contend with a lot of these around as well. Emerald ash borer, of course, is now raging throughout much of the state and continues to expand. And on Long Island, it has taken over here as well. There's a map just showing some of the areas that I had tracked earlier. It's gotten far beyond where those are indicated on that map as well. This is killing ash trees. It's not as much of an issue here on Long Island where ash is primarily a roadside tree. We have very little native ash forest in this area. It is much more of an issue upstate where there's a lot of wild ash and native ash. It also has economic value as a forest species. But there are impacts in neighborhoods, as you'll see here. This particular one had 50 trees that were affected, and that represents a fairly large hit for a community to have to deal with and remove those street side trees. Huntington, for example, I was told had about 20,000 of these that they couldn't afford to treat and deal with that annually. So that's going to be a, a hit on the uh, tax budget for, uh, for that community as well. And this is one that's, I think, on the way. This is winter moth. It is here. We have known about it for several years. Uh, this is just sort of the kind of early stage infestation you'll see. They actually go after trees right after the, uh, as the buds begin to open and sometimes even before they open, very, very early in the season. We do have had several infestations. There was one strongly suspect one of the foliation in the springs area. I have seen lots of moths on trees uh, and, uh, excuse me, lots of moths out this past fall. This is one case in Acrobog. I had another picture earlier this week from um, Amagansett, somebody saw lots of moths out in December. That is almost certainly winter moth, just judging from the, what, the images that I saw. So this will be an annoying inchworm pest that we'll deal with early in the spring. And then it's gone for the year, but it can cause heavy and repeat defoliations. And you don't want to see that um, adding to the stress that trees are already under in, the, uh, in our area. Um, I deal a lot with, of course, with landscapes and more than, than I deal with, say, wild forest areas. 
but uh, here's one that we do see being planted a lot more in landscapes. This is crepe myrtle, and it has the advantage of not just attractive bark and foliage in the fall, but it's also a pollinator resource late in the summer when it's a fairly dry period for pollinators that are looking for something to eat. This is a new pest uh, in our area. We've had several cases of this this past year. This is raging throughout much of the southeast, and uh, the crepe myrtles have their own aphid problem that is bad enough and affects some varieties more than others, but this one goes across all of the varieties and builds up to very, very high levels. So this will be pretty obnoxious and will also uh, be a reason that people will be needing to make insecticide applications. Uh, crepe myrtles are otherwise pretty tough and resilient plants in the area, and uh, they're ones that can tolerate the, our, our newly developed climate in this, in this region too. Um, the other concern of, is that this doesn't confine itself just to crepe myrtle, but also goes to some other native plants, including beautyberry. There's native and non-native beautyberries that are on the list. Some are more preferred than others, but as you can see, there's a, there's a research paper here that talks about some of the beautyberries that this particular bark scale does like. And it has other host range here. At least I have not heard that it's attacked these other hosts in the southeastern part of the country. Definitely in beautyberry, but not on so far these other ones where it remains to be seen. Sometimes Sometimes these invasive species come here not with their uh, not not uh, able to attack all the hosts that they do in their native country, much more restricted in some cases. But again, we'll see what develops as time goes on. And uh, boxwoods, boxwoods are continuing to be a very important landscape plant. Boxwood blight did not knock these out, and people still are planting a lot of them. But this may be a good time to think about boxwood alternatives. And for those of you who are uh, most, I think all of you in this room interested in native plants, this is an opportunity to think about what would you plant besides boxwood? Uh, maybe a uh, inkberry holly, for example, or you might have some other ideas in mind. But the one pest that's coming that I am really concerned about is box tree moth. This is a um, Eurasian, this is an Asian native. This has torn through much of Europe and decimated boxwoods there. I understand it's killed off about 70% of the unmaintained boxwoods. And although it's not difficult to control, it's difficult to um, anticipate and it's difficult to detect. And by the time you realize it's there, it's already caused a tremendous amount of damage. Um, this is uh, what the damage looks like. And it is also now found in Western New York, Massachusetts and Southeastern Ohio. So this is what your boxwood hedges will look like once box tree moth is in the area. And this is a map from uh, um, 2022. I haven't got the updated version, but it's expanded considerably from the western edge of New York and Niagara, Niagara Falls area. Uh, it is coming in, coming to us from the Toronto area and has uh, come across the border from there and continues to expand at least 20 miles a year. So and it's moving much further if it's moved on plant material. This is a, another uh, woolly aphid on hackberry. This one is uh, one that is seen in New York City. This has been more of an annoyance due to the honeydew and city mold generated as well as the waxy material. Uh, hackberry is a native plant. Not, it's somewhat widely grown as a street tree and more upstate than I would say down here on Long Island. And lily leaf beetle is a concern. This is uh, decimating garden lilies, but I have particular concern for the native lilies that are in our wild areas because this does kill the plants that it feeds on. It loves them so much. So uh, this is, you've probably seen this in your own gardens. This is the beetle on the adult on the right and the larvae on the left that cover themselves with their own droppings as defense. Um, we have, uh, this is another, another uh, one that's moved into the air. It's spotted wing Drosophila, 2011, came in, and this goes after small fruit. It also attacks native ones, um, and this can also serve as reservoirs for attacks that go into the commercial crops nearby. Uh, pepper thrips is one we've just seen in this past month. This has been a problem in Florida developing, coming in on tropical plants, but also has been a problem outdoors on peppers and beans, uh, causing millions of dollars of losses there. And we've had a case of it here in New York already. This is just some of the damage that that causes. And longhorn tick is another invasive that's spreading extremely rapidly. This is parthenogenic. This uh, just takes one to start infestation, mainly a pest of livestock and domestic animals and maybe even wild animals. It occasionally will bite humans. This is where it's found now and spreading, as I said, rapidly. And lastly, this, uh, just to give you a sense, uh, this is uh, some of the trials and the way we address this through one of our newsletters uh, branching out. We've released a biocontrol you'll see on the upper left for lily leaf beetle. We do some trials to find alternative controls and we've got, uh, we work with pollinators and other things. So any questions? Thank you.
Hi, thank you. I was just wondering, what is the biocontrol you are using for the little leaf beetle? The biocontrol we've used for lily leaf beetles, Tetrasticus certifer, uh, and we use a, another Lysiflebus to species too, but the Tetrasticus is the one that seems to be established and doing doing the best. Mm -hmm. So I missed the part about the pepper, the last, the I guess the last critter you were talking about that was on the peppers. Yeah, that that one is called pepper thrips, uh, thrips parvospinus. It is a big problem in Florida on foliage plants in particular, but it's also been outdoors in some crops like peppers and beans and caused pretty hard losses there as well. And we're seeing it a lot more in greenhouses because of the, probably because it's riding on plant material. Uh, it's also in Europe and we've had cases we think that have come in on plant material from Netherlands and from uh, Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. I'm surprised to hear you say that lanternfly is more of an annoying pest. I'm, are there not? Are they not killing trees at that high density? And then I guess also I'm curious about crepe myrtle because other people have called that an invasive species itself. And so, what your opinion on crepe myrtle is? Yeah, sorry, I didn't get your the second part of your question there. What was that? Uh... That the plant crepe myrtle itself is considered invasive nearby here, and so I'm curious what your perspective is on that. Well, I guess um, crepe myrtle I've heard is invasive in some areas. I don't know if that is determined for New York. Is that the case? Is it considered invasive in New York? Not yet. Yeah. So, and, and it may ultimately be, and in that case, we shouldn't be, shouldn't be planting it, of course. We should be looking to regulate that. Um, so, um, and then what was the other part of that question? Yeah, lantern flight has, at least in Pennsylvania, has not been a tree killer. Uh, that's what they tell me. The only time they've seen mortality is when the trees, especially uh, Tree of Heaven, uh, was in poor shape. And unfortunately, it doesn't kill tr uh, Tree of Heaven. It would be nice if it would. Uh, but uh, anyway, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Dan, for sharing your expertise. Um, again, we're a little tight on time, so we're going to move on. If you have any questions for him, you can catch him around the rest of the conference. Um, Next up, I'm very happy to welcome Laura Schwanoff. She's going to be um, talking about Long Island coastal ecosystems with her talk on living shorelines, applications, benefits, and shortfalls. Laura is the ecological practice leader uh, for GEI consultants in the Northeast. She conducts and trains GEI staff like myself <laughs> in ecological inventory, threatened and endangered species surveys, wetland delineation, habitat assessments and restoration, environmental permitting, and conservation planning. She has 44 years of related experience and is licensed as a landscape architect in the states of New York and Delaware. Laura is intricately familiar with the tri-state coastlines and estuaries, as well as the erosion, water quality, and flooding problems facing coastal communities in the, in the dynamic marine environment. Her design skills have been acutely focused on wetland restoration, living shorelines, and coastal stabilization projects that protect rare species and incorporate indigenous plants and innovative bioengineering techniques wherever practical and feasible. Please welcome Laura Schwanoff. Hi folks, thank you for uh, having me. Um, where we've been talking about the upland areas, we're gonna move to the shoreline. Obviously Long Island is surrounded by water um, and living shorelines are a big topic right now. So I wanna walk you through it as quickly as I can. Pardon me, because I don't do this very often. I hope that I can move these ahead. There we go. I didn't skip it. Okay. I did skip one slide. First of all, what's a living shoreline? A lot of people have different definitions of what would, what would um, you know, be a living shoreline. Living shorelines are not necessarily just planted areas. They may incorporate some hard structure um, you'll see in slides to follow, it might be coir logs, it might be oyster castles, it might be a stone sill, but it's an integral part of protecting the toe of a, uh, of a wetland system. So what's the benefits of living shorelines? Well, years ago when we didn't have any development on the upland side, um, as sea level rises, you have the opportunity for marshes to migrate upland. When you're in a developed area, your home is right on the shore. Everybody wants to be near their shore and have their boats and enjoy the waterfront. 
you don't have that opportunity for marsh migration. You have water coming into your basement or even worse and sandy flooding out your whole property. So living shorelines help to buffer that situation. Um, there's a lot of benefits to living shorelines. The, um, the biggest thing is they are sustainable. They provide so many benefits along the shorefront. Um, the one that I particularly like to focus on that living shorelines absorb moderate storm surge and dynamic energy. Marshes and oyster reefs act as natural barriers to waves. 15 feet of marsh can absorb 50% of incoming waves. That's one of the characteristics that's so beneficial about living shorelines. The other benefit of living shorelines is they're a lot cheaper than hardened alternatives. Not only are living shorelines providing habitat value, um, but they also, they're living systems. They're able to adapt, they're flexible. So, and they're very, you know, they're very effective in a dynamic marine environment. So this slide just illustrates the broad range of shoreline stabilization options. Obviously this morning, we're gonna stay more towards the left in the slide you know, taking a look at green approaches rather than the harder gray approaches. But we will talk a little bit about both. When you're in protective coves or um, less, less energy environments on the coast, you can pretty much benefit from more green type of approaches. When you're in a headland situation or an area that's subject to high wave and high wind energy, you have to consider more structural alternatives. So we're gonna talk about what are the best type of living shorelines for your area that you're working with. Um, we have to look at a number of factors. How is your property or your site vulnerable? What causes, you know, what causes the problem? And then look at the different type of solutions you could come with, come up with. Fetch is a really big component. Fetch is your distance of open water. If you're in a small cove or on a stream, a tidal stream or protected area, less than five, a half mile of fetch, living shorelines can work really well. But when you're in areas, as you see here, where open water distance is 12 miles, infinity and beyond on the South shore, Living shorelines are not that effective um, and they don't always hold up or stand up to the abuses along the coast. Another thing you have to consider, where are you in, you know, are you in a flood prone area? Now, talking about resiliency, that's real important if you have a home down on the coastal area, um, but it also gives you an idea of where living shorelines might be appropriate appropriately located. Again, location, location, location is critical for living shorelines. Um, the one thing that you have to keep in mind, obviously, if you're a homeowner along the waterfront, being too close to the shore, we know sea level rise is happening. Um, we need to think about, are we going to sit there and deal with it and fight natural, you know, natural sources of uh, um, mother nature? you know, rising sea levels, or are we gonna consider retreat? You can see here what's happening over time with that building that's, you know, that's stable. It's not going anywhere. It's gonna be in underwater in the future. Okay, just wanna talk a little bit about where living shorelines might be appropriate to be considered for shoreline stabilization or habitat enhancement. Um, up in, I, I don't know how to use a laser pointer, but where you see the red dot, that's considered a headland. It's the area that's um, most exposed, high energy shorelines, not necessarily a good place to be considering living shorelines. It's an area that you probably have to bring in some hardened structures. Um, the reason I bring this whole topic up is it's, it's very, um, it's pr living shorelines are being promoted by a lot of 
natural resources agencies, and they're wonderful where they work, but they're not a panacea. You cannot put living shorelines everywhere. And although many times we're asked to do so, and we can predict and tell the agencies it's not gonna work, we still have to do it. So I just, I, I'm gonna back away from that, that, um, that talk, but there are good places to put it and there are places where living shorelines might not work. So I wanna walk you through that. Headlands are not very good because they're high energy areas. Straight shorelines are not that great. They, um, living shorelines can be put in. That's where you see the yellow dot. The best locations for living shorelines are where you see the green dots. Anywhere that's in a protected cove or an area maybe at the um, head of a tidal creek. Actually, one of my first living shorelines was up in Bayville in that protected cove that you see, Turtle Cove. And that has expanded into a nice marsh. Again, just a quick review. Low energy sites are um, ideal for living shorelines. Medium energy sites are um, fairly good, but where you tend to have more high energy area where you're having you know, two to five foot waves and storm, um, storm surges, you have to start to look at hybrid situations, bringing in more of that um, structural approach to the toe of the living shoreline. High energy sites like the headlands, generally not a good place to consider living shorelines. Okay, we're gonna take a look at some of the applications. Where do sh living shorelines work? what to look for when you're trying to decide the treatment. We'll get through each one of these bullets as we go. One of the key things to look at with a living shoreline, besides fetch, we'll hit that again, but what is our tidal range? Think about it. Plants are adapted to a certain range of salinity and flooding. If you have, as you do further west towards the city, a tidal range of seven, nine, 10 feet, it's a lot more difficult to develop living shoreline solutions. You have to be very um, innovative in putting something together that would work. Where you get into embayments and your you know, tidal fluctuation is only two feet, it's a lot easier to come up with a living shoreline that might be able to work there. Again, we talked about fetch. Where would something work? Obviously, if you see that slide to the lower right in a headland situation like that, it's gonna be near impossible to just apply a living shoreline. One of the key things you also have to think about in developing a treatment, um, a treatment plan, overland and subsurface flows could be very damaging to a living shoreline. We're dealing that with that right now in Port Jefferson, if anybody had seen that in the news, but um, it's something that has to be intercepted and um, drained away from the face or the uh, shoreline to be able to support your um, stabilization practices. Another thing to consider with living shorelines you have to have the appropriate slope. If you have a really steep slope and a very short beach, it's gonna be very difficult to tackle that with a living shoreline solution. Um, where you have a gradual slope, five to one, 10 to one, that's a lot more appropriate and you can get a living shoreline on that. The other thing with living shorelines, because they evolve over time, when you have a shallower slope, you can get marsh migration. As the sea level rises, those plants can march further up in elevation. This slide basically depicts some of the different components of a living shoreline. As I mentioned earlier, it's not just plants, it's also other components. Um, here are a couple examples of where living shorelines have worked. You can see on the upper left, in a small protected cove, you can get away with just using coral logs on the toe and planting you know, tidal wetland vegetation behind. 
where you have a little bit more wave energy, you might need a stone sill to break the um, impact of waves. Oyster castles are another big thing. We're hoping to get more of these in New York. Um, they will be a little bit offshore and generally designed to reach the mean high water level to do a wave break. And behind that, you can build your, your natural um, wetland system. Another example over on the, on the left, this is a spot I've seen down in Bayport. Very interesting, I'd never seen an application like this, but there was bulkhead, then there was stone. So if waves crested the bulkhead, they would, the, the energy would dissipate in the stone. Above that is a perched beach or a perched wetland. And then behind that even is stone in case the waves were too intense. It's working. Do I promote something like this? There's more structure in it than ecological benefits. It works. I'm not saying it's the best solution, but I was surprised to find it and it did work on the South Shore. There's other, there's other methods to um, install living shorelines depending on the type of slope, the location. On the lower right, you're seeing the edge of a living crib wall, and we'll talk about that more later. And at the base of that slope, fascines, bundled twigs, live twigs are being installed instead of a coir log. As, you know, as those, those cut dormant live twigs um, get warmed up, they start to grow into a shrub mass, which will help protect the toe of that slope. I think I'm stuck. The other thing we have to be cognizant of with living shorelines is that sea level rise is coming. We can't deny it. Um, with, you know, the, the research says that there's been one foot of rise over the last 100 years, one foot of rise in sea level. Um, projections vary for the future. So in seven years, we might have seven inches to 14 inches in elevation rise for sea level. Kind of a scary thought. When we look at 100 years from now, three feet to 15 feet. Can you imagine the homes that are right on the shorefront? In any case, whenever you're looking at some shoreline protection or doing a living shoreline, we have to account for that growth and Evo the, the material evolving over time to catch up or to keep up with that shoreline, the uh, sea level rise. Another thing you have to, you have to take into account whenever you're planning a living shoreline is not just the static elevation of where the water is, not just your mean sea level, but anytime you have, um, an intense storm, you'll have wave run up that will wet the area above it and result in salinity increases. So when you pick plant materials, you better be aware that you have to have salt tolerant species further up on the shorefront rather than right down at the water's edge. This is just a summary of how to look at various vegetative treatments on the shoreline. Um, it's a lot to digest here, I understand. But again, it's another review. Low energy environments, you know, where you have a shallow slope, uh, five to one along the uh, shorefront, you may be able to just get away with putting in tidal wetland plants. As you get steeper, you have to incorporate some kind of erosion control at the toe. Um, you see there that the coir log is serving as your perched or your protection at the toe and your plantings behind it. Now, the idea of a coir log is it gives you immediate stabilization and protection of those new plants you put in. Over time, as those plants take root, they themselves become the method of stabilizing the shorefront and take over and become a marsh. When you get on steeper slopes, you get high to medium energy uh, I mean, medium energy sites on steeper slopes, you need more than vegetation to stabilize that shorefront. And you need more than just vegetation that's adapted 
right now to the tidal conditions, you have other issues going on, overland flows, seepage, um, the slope itself might not be stable. So that's when you have to start to incorporate other structural means. Um, there is a treatment I'm not showing here, but we'll talk later. A brush mattress works really well on up to two to one slopes. That photo I showed earlier with the uh, fascines at the base, that was the base of a brush mattress. And a brush mattress is basically twigs that are laid on the surface. I think I have a slide coming. Twigs laid on the surface that are dormant. And initially those twigs become this, are the structural support. And over time, as the plants grow through it, that becomes your support. And then when you get in high energy environments, you've got to look at structural, structural um, improvements. Some of the shortfalls with living shorelines, right off the bat, I said, one size does not fit all. Every site is site specific. You have to take into account all those factors we talked about earlier. Um, again, agencies often require living shorelines for any shoreline project but they might not work over time. And it's really important when you are the planner or the designer to let those folks who are relying on you to come up with a shoreline solution, to let them know. Living shorelines are flexible systems, living systems. They don't stay there forever. You need to maintain them. You can't just build it and walk away like you might be able to do with a bulkhead at elevation 16 or 17. Um, there is maintenance required, but there's all the benefits associated with it. You've got, you build an ecological system, you provide habitat, nursery areas for fish and wildlife. Some of the other issues I've encountered with living shorelines is all the material is not readily available. You think about it, we're on Long Island, we don't have a natural source of stone. We have to bring it in from upstate New York. So that's one issue you have to deal with with living shorelines. The other is the material. Um, living shorelines in freshwater systems, um, large lakes, great lakes, you can use a lot of uh, freshwater plant material that's readily available in the market. It's been around for a while, but here on Long Island, when you get into that upper marsh area, you really have only two salt tolerant shrubs to work with and they're not available in a large quantity. Slowly that number is coming up, but also the adaptation of using that instead of other types of vegetation or freshwater system, it's still being developed. It's not fully, um, all the bugs haven't been worked out yet. If we have time, I hope we do, okay. I want to run through a scenario of a case study. Um, Brett is not in the room, but Brett was part of this. There you are. Um, Brett was an integral part of this, of this project. This project called Big Rock Wetland Restoration is happening in Queens, New York, in Douglaston. Um, at this point, I want to acknowledge the Matinecock Nation. Um, this is an area that they have been involved in. They continue um, to be involved and will be involved through the planning and the, and the construction phase of this project. But this project is seeking to bring back a natural system that into an area that has been long disturbed and turned into basically a biological wasteland, just being filled with a monoculture of Phragmites or common reed. In any case, this project is being funded by Save the Sound. They're very much on board. New York State DEC is very much on board. It's in the planning process now. I'm gonna walk you through some of the different aspects and we hope to start construction this summer. This is just an overview of the project area. On the right photo is north. At the very end, it's somewhat of a headland. There's a lot of erosion, a lot of wind and wave energy up there. So we need to do something very special up in that area. Um, down further south into the cove, where you see Memorial Field, 
you have a much more gradual slope. There isn't a large fetch. Um, there's a greater possibility to design or bring in a living shoreline that allows marsh migration. This is an overview of what this project is all about. On the northern end, where we say it's almost like a headland, what's being planned there is a vegetated revetment, basically a rock placement on a slope to help with that wave run up situation. But the community really wants to see green, so we're gonna interplant that rock with plant materials. As you move further down in the, in the belly of this area, the brightest green, that's where the Phragmites are gonna be removed, the elevation's gonna be taken down, and a tidal marsh will be restored as it was many years ago. Um, that area, Brett can account for that, may have been many, many years ago a tidal marsh, then evolved into a freshwater system because of all the sediment and material that came off the upland through the development phase. Um, and now it's pretty much just a irregular shaped with a lot of debris in it, a, a Phragmites monoculture. To the far south where Memorial Field is, we're planning to do a, um, a marsh migration zone, basically taking the elevations down, making a gradual slope, developing a, um, a tidal marsh that will, be, that will be allowed to go up in time as sea level rises. So what are the, some of the components? Over to the right, uh, over to the left, you can see in that situation, that was a project in Fresh Kills, New York, where the landfill is. Um, that was um, taking down the elevation of the, the garbage that was there, bringing it down, taking the Phragmites out, and putting in a coir log at that leading edge for protection of the new wetland system. The lower left is what that area looks like now. And I've been back there 11 years after it went in. Um, it's as good, if not better, than the reference marsh we were looking at. So if you get the elevations right, if you've got the plants right, if you have an additional seed source in the regional area, wetlands will come back and flourish if you get all those factors correct. On the uh, right is what I was talking about earlier. It's a brush mattress. Um, it's a technique that incorporates both structure and living material. So a brush, mattr a brush mattress is composed of cut live stakes or poles that are laid up on the slope. And initially that becomes the structure to hold that, help that slope stay in place. At the bottom is bundles of twigs, fascines. As the growing season goes on, that material all um, germinates or, or starts to grow. And you develop that on the lower right, you develop that vegetated shoreline, which is a lot nicer to look at besides it provides um, ecological function to the area rather than seeing a bulkhead or just a, a strict stone revetment or a seawall. I also mentioned um, various means to incorporate green living plant materials into more structural components. So on the, lo on the loft, you can see that's a, a live timber crib wall. The crib wall is created either by using cut logs, or in this case, timbers, um, with open space in between and, and um, dormant poles and live stakes are pushed through the front of the timber crib. The idea is as those shrubs start to take root and start to um, grow on the outside, they tend to become the stabilization for that shorefront instead of the structure. So it's one way to deal with steeper slopes. And then on the far right is a vegetated revetment. You're not just seeing stone, but you're seeing some of the native salt shrubs growing through the stone. Um, all of this, all of these different practices help in terms of rising sea levels as well. 
that kind of structure at the toe over time will then support wetlands behind it more landward. One of the last components of the um, Big Rock project, and we're still stumbling over it with the <laughs> review agencies, but we want to incorporate oyster castles. And uh, that's what you see here on the left slide. Those oyster castles are being put in the ground. On the right side, that's what we hope to see at Big Rock after the oyster castles are installed. So I've come to the end of my presentation. I could talk for hours on this topic, but I'm happy to take any questions you might have. On the oyster castles, are you putting uh, live oysters in it? Is that to clean the water as well, or is it just shells? So that's a really good question. <laughs> um, oyster castles are intended to, number one, be a block for wave energy. The oyster castles pretty much right now are an ecocrete product. They're like a concrete, and they're they've got openings or holes and uh, a rough surface for shellfish to attach to. In our case, we want to see these oyster, oyster castles with, with seed from oysters, live oysters. That's where we're running into a little bit of a, a sticking point with the agencies. Oysters, because they're um, you know, food source for us, if oysters are put in an area that are not completely clean, water bodies not completely clean. Agencies are reluctant to allow that because people could come in and harvest it and get sick from it. But these type of pilot projects have gone into the Bronx River. So let me tell you, it's work there and they thrive and they clean the water. So we're hoping we're, we're gonna be able to bring this to Long Island. Another question? What's that? We can take one more question. Somebody in a flash. I, I'm, yeah. or, okay. Do we have someone up there? Okay. Uh, just want to know your experience uh, and the responsiveness of the townships themselves, especially along the South Shore. Uh, are the townships responsive to this climate change and, and the rising of water for uh, housing communities that front the bays, uh, because at some point it becomes redundant, uh, maintaining this, not only the houses, but the infrastructure of electricity, roads, gas, pipes, sewage. Your, your comments on that, thoughts, thank you. That could be a whole day <laughs> discussion. Um, yes, many South Shore communities are very interested and wanna embrace this approach. There's still a lot of hiccups with are they ever going to be approved? Um, the re natural resource agencies are coming around to understand that this is a viable technique in many cases, very helpful. What it's not going to do is stop flooding. If you're in a low-lying area, your house is right on the waterfront, you know, sea level rise is going to take over. We're not stopping it. Um, so there's some pushback. I was involved in a project on the east end, and we presented what the impacts might be in 50 years to some of those communities. And some of those communities are gonna be cut off from the main portions of Long Island. What are the answers there? Relocate, move further inland, relocate, change your zoning codes. You know, that's some of the things that towns, unfortunately, have to deal with. You're on the front line as town uh, officials dealing with something like that. And, you know, as, as consultants, we try to spell all the scenarios out to who we work with, you know, giving you an idea of how long this treatment will last. Hopefully whoever is working with the towns or even private citizens um, can lay that out for folks so they can make the best, you know, the best choices for themselves. I don't know if I answered that question. Okay. Thank you very much. All righty. Thank you, Laura, for that very informative and timely presentation.
Um, as we transition, transition to our next section of the conference, a quick reminder about credits. If you're looking to receive CEUs, please sign in and out of each session, either using the forms at the back of the room or the QR code in the presentation. If you're seeking credits remotely, please complete the form via the QR code or the link in the chat for signing in and out of each session. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to Rob Longero to introduce our keynote speaker.